Let's talk about today first. What are you going to tell everybody here? I'm being asked to just tell my story today. There's just a lot on the program, so I'm just being asked to tell briefly my story to give an example of why it's important to have an advocacy center. What happens to a life when there's no prevention, intervention, no therapy, no healing? What happens to that child? So let's follow that child into adulthood and look at my life and, and, and see why we need to start protecting children. Right. So that's what you tell your story and you hope it translates into helping others. I know it does. Mm -hmm. I know it does. Where do we start? Tell me about tell me about your memories of what happened beginning when you were just five years old. I was five, and my father started coming into my room at night. It stopped when I left for college at age 18. If he came in one night a week for 13 years, that's over 600 times. And I know as a teenager it was more often than that. And my one of my overriding memories is just... Don't allow yourself to feel anything. Just shut off, just just shut off feelings. Just shut down. Shut everything down. And I got pretty good at, at doing that. The problem is, is that when you marry the man of your dreams, and all you have learned is to shut your entire system down, then you have to begin a whole new process of trusting and um, allowing feelings, and that 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 can be a long process. I married so well. <laughs> I did. I fell in love with my husband when I was 15. We've been married 45 years. He has stories to tell. That's, that's, that's a fairy tale story. Do you remember the earliest memory? I mean, do you remember the first time and, and being that little girl and thinking what's happening? What I remember is a, a little child's rocking chair and a, a doll in the chair. What I remember is the shame I had that the doll could see what was happening. That's what I remember. And I hated dolls. I, I, I've always hated dolls. I never had a doll. I didn't know why. And then all of a sudden I remembered the doll in the chair and she was watching. And I was just so ashamed. And you never thought about in all those years telling anybody? There was no one to tell. There was, there was no one to tell. I told my mother when I was 48, a year after my father had died, in gut-wrenching, heaving sobs. And she looked at me and she said, I don't believe you. It's in your fantasy. If my mother wasn't going to believe a 48-year-old successful adult with my father dead, what chance was I going to have as a child? She lived to 88. I turned to her many times during my, we call it the recovery process in my late 40s. She was never able to say the words I needed to hear. She said to me, we, we almost never spoke of it, and it was in the newspaper on a regular basis. And I testified in Washington, D.C. before a subcommittee. And word filtered back, and Mother called me. This was the only time I can remember that she ever commented on the hundreds of things that I said. And she said, you said something today that really hurt me. You said your father pried you open. I did. I said, I did say that, Mother. They're saying he molested me. And I thought I needed more descriptive words. And she said, don't say that again. Gosh, it's just, it's, it's hard to fathom that, that you were able to become the person you were. I mean, a Miss America. When we look I had, at Miss America, we think, my like, there's a young woman who has everything. Which is one of the reasons I do what I do. Um, many of us who are repeatedly raped hide in shame and become drug addicts and alcoholics and do nothing with our lives. And there are others of us who have to excel and be perfect to balance how we really feel about ourselves. And it is exhausting to try to be perfect. It's just an exhausting way. I had to be the best at everything I did. It's an exhausting way to live. And that didn't stop until I was 53. When my story became public, and every, everybody, everybody knew, cover of People magazine, I didn't have to be perfect anymore. And I'm going, oh, okay. Now everybody knows the worst thing that anybody can know about me, so I don't have to do this anymore. I just don't have to do it anymore. It was very 
freeing. I didn't think it was going to be freeing, but it was very freeing. People still spoke to me. People still admired me. Ah, that just that was unfathomable to me. How could anybody know Larry? I fell in love with Larry when I was 15. And I kissed him goodnight at the door when I was 15 and 16 and 17 and 18. And when I had to tell him, and I could almost see his mind, because I was, I was a perfect teenager. I could see his mind going back to kissing me at the door and all of a sudden thinking she was going through the door down the hall to her father. And I, I just thought, I just thought he will never, ever, ever want to see me again. And he just put his arms around me and he said, I understand everything now. He just is the most kind, loving, I told him when I was 24, finally. And he has never once said to me, why didn't you stop him? You can't as a child. You're patterned. And I'd say to Larry, I was 18. I was 130 pounds. He'd say, you were patterned as a child. There's nothing you could have done. So he didn't ever blame me or shame me.